Welcome to skills class. People are jumping on, I hope. Anyway, we're continuing from last week. And this week, we've got asthma, allergies, diabetes, and then various health problems that you may encounter if you have an orphanage or a school. Asthma is a breathing problem in which the breathing tubes to the lungs become clogged, partially clogged by excessive mucus. They become inflamed and the muscles around them squeeze them tight. So it causes problems breathing. And 10% of people in Kenya have asthma, but it's more common in cities where there's pollution, any roaches, the roach droppings irritate asthma. And also smokers, you know, that irritates a lot. It can be triggered by allergies, exercise, excessive heat, excessive cold, infections, and of course, air quality. If there's a fire in the area, that can really trigger it as well. Best position if someone is having an asthma attack is sitting up, leaning slightly forward. And they can use something called pursed lipped breathing. This is a technique that really, really helps. And what it does is it creates some resistance so that the air that you do get gets pushed through the lungs into the bloodstream with some greater force. So I am going to demonstrate. Juliet, purse lip breathing for mm -hmm. asthma. I'm going to demonstrate, and that would be you make like a kiss with your lip. Like that. This really, really helps people with asthma to get more oxygen and can really assist, especially if you're waiting for an ambulance or medicine to be brought or anything and um the the best thing though is the rescue inhaler the most common rescue inhaler is called albuterol it's also called proair or ventolin these are all the same medicine by different companies um albuterol relaxes those muscles squeezing the breathing tubes and so they can open at least, you, it may not get rid of mucus, but at least the breathing tubes are more wider than they were. So that is wonderful. You can also use a spacer on your albuterol. I'm going to show you a picture of it. And what a spacer does is it maximizes the amount of medication that you get. This is a picture. I'm going to try and get it so you could see the whole thing. Okay, there we go. So the the um, medicine goes in the hole on the side. On this side, you just plug the pump in here, and then the mask goes over their nose and mouth, and the medicine gets stuck in here until they're ready to breathe it. And that's really helpful for those children and especially any special adults or adults that don't know the breathing technique because basically the idea is I tell the kids blow out and I go to release the medicine and then I tell them breathe in and hold it like you're underwater. And if they can hold their breath, keep the medicine in their lungs for a while, that really, really helps them to get the medicine to their lungs. If they blow it out right away, you know, it's not as good, but the spacer helps a lot. Spacer helps a lot. So um, you can ask the person who prescribed the albuterol how many puffs to give and for how long and all that. I usually give for 20 seconds, two pups, but you know, every doctor will prescribe something different probably. 
Um, okay. And then um, keeping calm really, really helps. If they are upset and they're breathing really fast, try to, you know, ask them to think of something calm. Tell them, think about unicorns running on the beach and the mane is flowing and give them some a toy to hold or something that will calm them down. So that's basically it for asthma. So the medicine is the big help. The purse lip breathing is the little help, but they need medicine. So they should keep their pump with them. Next, we're going to move on to allergies. Allergies are an immune system problem in which the immune system becomes reactive to a protein that the person eats or inhales or touches. And the immune system thinks that that protein is a foreign invader, like a bacteria, a virus, or something harmful. Of course, we know that peanuts are not harmful, but the body thinks that peanuts are harmful. So the body will react with all this mucus, inflammation, rash, swelling, all these things. And the most common allergens or things you are allergic to would be peanuts, nuts, fish, shellfish, wheat. Some people are allergic to wheat, soybeans, milk, or eggs. Um, Juliet, did you want to say something? Okay, so just please mute. Thank you, thank you. Um, latex perfumes and bee stings are other common ones. Um, bee stings, especially to this area of the body. If you're allergic to a bee sting and you get a sting in this area of the body, it's very dangerous because the swelling that occurs can cut off the breathing. And that's why some people carry an EpiPen very expensive solution. Um, they're over a hundred dollars for an EpiPen and that would decrease the swelling immediately. Um, they also have uh, antihistamines, which are taken by mouth, take about 15, 20 minutes to work. And those can reduce swelling, itching, hives, you know, reduce all that as well. Um, you can ask your doctor or pharmacist or the child's doctor or pharmacist what to give and how much to give. And a person can be allergic to almost anything. Um, and an allergy can occur or start at any time in a person's life. So an allergy can just develop suddenly. They may have been eating you know, peanuts their whole life. And now all of a sudden they're getting symptoms. So it can happen to anyone at any time. So just be aware of that. And you got to teach the child to avoid what they are allergic to or the adult to avoid what they are allergic to. That is the best prevention to avoid what they're allergic to. And um, when you prepare food, if you know the person is alert, you have an allergic person, you don't want to switch spoons from one thing to the other. Because if you had a dish with peanuts in it and you switch the spoon to the porridge, now the porridge is contaminated with peanuts and that person can not get really sick from eating the porridge, which is bad. Um, don't eat foods with unknown ingredients. So if someone gives you a bar and you think it might be oatmeal, but you really don't know, you got to read the label or just don't eat it. If you know you're allergic to peanuts, just don't eat it because it could have peanuts or could have been made on machinery that processed peanuts. So better to not eat it. Now, if you did eat it and then you read the, I got it, it's peanuts, then that's bad. But there are some things you can do. If the person is alert, 
you can have them rinse their mouth. Get the peanut that is in their mouth out of their mouth. If they are allergic to milk and milk got spilled on their hand, wash their hands. Only makes sense, right? Okay, we get some people joining. Hi, Diana. Hi. I am going over asthma and allergies. A medical emergency of allergies would be any kind of swelling of the throat, lips, tongue, or face. Because the breathing passage, you can't see inside. So the breathing passage could be swelling without you knowing it. And the breathing could stop if it gets, you know, swollen enough. So you would call an ambulance if they had a bee sting to the neck or they were, they ate something and then they're getting swelling of the tongue. The tongue can actually swell up enough to close up the entire mouth and the back of the throat where the nose can breathe through the back of the throat. It can, it can block off both. So that's why we call the ambulance if there's swelling of the tongue, lips, face, or throat. So that's it for allergies. Does anyone have any questions up to now? Good to see you guys. All right, I'm going to move on to diabetes. Diabetes is a pancreas problem in which the pancreas does not produce enough insulin. And in some cases, it doesn't produce any insulin. Insulin is a hormone that helps your cells to get the sugar that's in the blood into the cells. So what happens with these people is the sugar level in the blood goes high, higher and higher and higher. You can't get into the cells. And when the sugar level gets very high in the blood, it makes the blood more viscous, meaning it's like honey, it's thick. And that's why people who have diabetes have circulation problems. And some of them end up losing toes or fingers or even a leg because the blood is so thick that it cannot get through, cannot get through the small vessels with enough speed to deliver oxygen. And they experience a lot of deoxygenization. And a lot of times that leads to infections as well. Um, so you will notice a person who is having high blood sugar may be hungry because the glucose is not getting into their cells. So they may be hungry. They may be excessively thirsty. They may urinate a lot. They may get blurry vision and um, slow healing on any wounds they have. Now, high blood sugar is not necessarily a medical emergency, but it causes damage to the body over the years. And it can cause kidney failure, blindness, stroke, um, amputations, um, lack of because of lack of circulation. Um, yeah, so a lot of problems from high blood glucose in the long term. But with diabetes, it's also possible to get low blood glucose if the person exercises vigorously or they don't eat, they have no appetite, they don't eat, or they don't have money to buy food. If they don't get their three meals a day, they could go low. And that is a, a medical emergency. They can pass out, they can get a seizure, they can even go into a coma from low blood glucose. So if they are saying that they're feeling shaky and tired, you want to give them something to eat that's fast, fast, you know, carbs, fast carbohydrates, like for instance, crackers, porridge, 
a sweet drink. Now, normally diabetics, you're not supposed to have sweets um, for the most part. But if you're low, that's exactly what you need. You need to bring yourself up. So something sweet, a candy, um, you could put it under the tongue even, sugar, milk, honey. Um, fruit punch is great. Something to raise the blood sugar to take them out of the emergency. But if they can't take anything by mouth because they're not alert, you got to call the ambulance right away. Um, and if anyone needs me to teach you how to do a finger stick, I can do that another time. I'm not going to do that today. But if you ever need that help, I'll meet with you special and I'll teach you how to do a finger stick. Um, anyone who's trained by a nurse can do it. A parent, a, you know, teacher. One who's trained and knows how to do it can do it. It's a very simple process. Um, okay. So that's it for diabetes. Any questions on diabetes? All right. I'm going to move on to what are germs because germs are like the main reason a lot of people go into the hospital. And I want to show you what they look like. You may not have ever had the privilege of looking in one of those beautiful microscopes. Oh, this is upside down. Sorry. Yeah. So um, germs, like these ones here are bacteria. Germs are so small. We can't see them. But if you look through a microscope, you can see them. These are bacteria. This is a virus. This is also a virus, looks very different. This one looks like a little spaceship, but it's a virus just like this one. And then, oh, this one here, maybe I'll bring it closer. This one here is another type of bacteria. These are hot dog shaped or long shaped bacteria. You're not gonna see any of these with the naked eye, only with a microscope on lips. There are a lot of bacteria all together. Now here is where you can see them. So this here. Let me mute. Sorry. Okay. Have to mute you. Some background noise. So this here is a petri dish. A petri dish is a dish that is designed to feed bacteria. It has agar agar in it. Agar agar is from seaweed and it's yummy bacteria food. So you pour the agar agar into the dish and then somebody put their hand on the agar agar for just one touch. Took their hand away. They put the Petri dish into the heater and heated it overnight, maybe a couple days. And this is what they got. And you can actually see the colonies of bacteria with the naked eye. That's what they look like. Basically, they're slimy. They're slimy. You're seeing the actual cells of one bacteria that was in the middle. It grew and created more bacteria around it. So you're seeing those cells and their poop, which could be any color, their poop. And all this is slimy. Eesh. Yuck. <laughs> now, our best defense against bacteria is hand washing. Take a little soap, rinse, rub, rub, scrub, scrub to break the bond of the bacteria to your hands. And then you rinse. And what happens? I'm going to show you my drawing. The bacteria go down the drain of the sink when you wash your hands. And that's what you want. You want them to go. <laughs> okay. So germs are very important to keep off your hands because we put our hands in our mouth, touch our eyes, we can't help it. We have to do these things sometimes. And if you touch a wound, 
you're getting germs into your bloodstream, which is not good. So keep germs from spreading. Okay. Keep germs from spreading. If you have to sneeze, don't sneeze like this, because then now you got to wash your hands. Better to sneeze like this. <gasps> because the bend of your elbow doesn't open doorknobs or anything like that. The bend of your elbow doesn't do anything, really, except holds the rest of your arm and hand, right? So sneeze into the bend of your elbow. Try not to put your hands in your mouth, eyes, nose, ears, or cuts. Keep your living space clean. Use antibacterial wipes on tabletops, doorknobs, sink knobs, especially if someone is sick in your house. And wash your hands or use hand sanitizer. You can use it two twice. And then you have to wash your hands on the third time. But if your hands are visibly soiled, better to just wash them. Okay, so wash your hands. If they look dirty before making food, before eating, after using the bathroom, after being with someone who's sick and helping them, and after touching animals, garbage, or dirty tissues. Those are like the big ones. But use your judgment. Now, animals, turtles, have something called salmonella. So if you touch a turtle, you got to wash your hands because salmonella, it make you very, very sick. Um, other animals have other things. We don't know what's on these animals, so we have to be careful. Okay. And chicken poop, pigeon poop. I don't know about chicken poop, but I know pigeon poop can be deadly. You touch pigeon poop and put your hands in your mouth, you can die from that. I know of somebody who died from that in my state, um, state of New York. Um, she put her hands on the windowsill where the pigeons had pooped. And eventually maybe she went to eat after that or whatever. And she ended up dying of that. So be careful of any poops and um, wash your hands as much as you can. Now, I know in some places you have typhoid in the water. I know in Uganda, there's typhoid in the water. So that water has to be boiled and cooled before you can really use it. You don't want to get the typhoid fever and make you very, very sick. Um, I'm going to go to wounds because that's a quick one. Wounds is a quick one. Okay, if somebody gets a cut, child, anybody gets a cut, you do not want to touch that wound because if you touch it you have germs on your finger even if it's only a few you, you touch in that wound you're getting bacteria in it what happens is you get an infection in the wound it delays wound healing it swells up it gets hot it gets very painful and you get something called pus or drainage the drainage of a bacteria, as we were talking about bacteria poop, can be any color, it can be orange, it can be brown, it can be green, yellow. That drainage indicates you got bacteria in the wound and you may need antibiotics to heal it. If you get um, like sort of sticky, rubbery, uh, white stuff, that is actually different white little balls of goo coming out of your wound means that is dead white blood cells that went to that area, killed germs, and now they have died. They're coming out of the wound. So you can clear that away. And the way you do that, any drainage, whatever color it is, to clear it away, what you want to do is boil water, cool it, pour it into the center of the wound first and let it flow outwardly toward the edges of the wound. And that's the best way. 
to keep the flow going from the center word, it pushes germs away from the wound. And then you want to dry it with a, if you have a sterile gauze, that's great. Um, and then um, you want to put a cover over it. You can use gauze or you can use a Band-Aid like this one. It's wrapped in a sterile package. So you can use a little bit, they have all sizes, little Band-Aids, big Band-Aids. Here's the picture of the Band-Aids. They make them in all different colors and sizes. And this is proven by statistics and experiments. These Band-Aids are proven to increase the speed of wound healing and to keep germs out. So it's a really great thing. Now, some people like have to wash their hands a lot. Every time you wash your hand, you got to change the Band-Aid. If you can't, if your wound is healing and you can't wear a Band-Aid, make sure you put one on at night because it really helps. All right. This is a brand of, I mean, you probably don't have this brand, but this is a kind of ointment. Ointment is very helpful for wounds healing because ointment is made of the same thing that the cell membranes are a major ingredient of the cell membrane, which is fat. If you don't have ointment, I'm trying to gear this toward people that don't have a lot of resources. And if you don't, if you can't buy this, okay, coconut oil is great. Even unsalted butter will work. But if they're salted it, don't use it because it's gonna hurt. It's gonna burn. But you could use unsalted butter or coconut oil to um, soothe the pain of the cut and also assist with healing because you're putting the building blocks of the cell membrane right in the wound, which is giving it availability to rebuild the cells. So it's wonderful to put something. Now, where I work, you can't use this because they're saying, oh, somebody could be allergic to it. Yeah, very rare, very rare. But I just wanted to tell you, if somebody says I'm allergic to coconut, don't put coconut oil in their wound, okay? And um, that would be very important to protect them. All right, let's go on to some... Common things I see in the course of school nursing, and you're going to see these. If you have an orphanage or a school, you're going to see these problems. And they would be fever, pink eye, bites. Um, I bumped my name, very common. Um, and I also want to talk about um, hydration and sickle cell disease. But I think since we're already at half an hour, we'll save this for next time. This is going to be really important because I'm actually going to teach you what you can do for each of these things to help. And um, we will continue it next week. And then after we finish medical, we are going to start with, um, our skills class is going to start with how to teach children, how to teach them so that they will remember what you teach and how to accommodate their age. And if they're special, like challenge, you know, I'm gonna teach you how to teach kids so that they'll remember what you're trying to tell them. So next week is some, you know, medical first aid. And then after that, we'll go into teaching. But thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And I will see you next week. And I'll have a little prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for those who came and those who will watch the replay. I pray that they will have their life enhanced by better first aid practices and understanding of germs. And I pray that, that all the children under their care will be well cared for and happy and healthy. And I ask these things in your name, Jesus Christ, amen. And by the way, I want to tell you one more thing. One more thing. Band-Aids can keep a child, make them stop crying. <laughs> they, they stop crying when you called? give them a Band-Aid. <laughs> what was that? What is it called? Oh, we call it a Band-Aid. Uh, I'll open it up so you can see it. But it's uh, just a little cover with a sticker, you know, that this is, it opens up, it opens up like this. And then you can put it on the finger mm -hmm. and then you peel off the side. And this is sticky here. And you can put it right on the wound. You want the pad on the wound. If you're going to use, if you're going to use ointment, Put a little ointment on the little pad. And that this is sterile, by the way. There's no germs on this. That's why it's in the package. So you put it there and then not too tight. Remember, not too tight. And that will keep the child from crying. It's wonderful. They immediately stop crying because they know somebody cared and took care of them. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> did you have any questions the, the no, is on I don't too. have any questions okay. okay well you guys have a great day god bless you I'm going to stop the recording and I'll... 